Hello and welcome to a really special show with somebody who's really special to all of us, Vince Cerf, the man who has been often described along with Bob Khan as the father of the internet. Are you proud of that paternity, by the way, before I move on? <laughs> well, I've learned something. I have two sons, and one thing I learned was don't take too much credit when they do well, because if they don't do well, you don't want to take too much blame. So um, I would like to point out that although Bob Kahn and I did the original design work and I have been pursuing internet uh, ever since, a lot of other people had to be committed to make this thing happen. Uh, I'm just glad that I got to be around to start this off. All right, well, we are going to call you, Bint, as the please, fa father please. of the internet out here. So it's great to have you with us. You're also, of course, VP Google Chief Internet Evangelist, which is a, a lovely title to have, which I do want to ask you about. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great title to have. And we do have out here a large audience filled with young people. As you know, the median age in India is 24, so we've got that median age, I this think, approximately. This is India? Wow. Yes, okay. right out here. Uh, you know, before I proceed with Bint, I just want to do a, some unscientific snap polling out here. How many of you feel that the internet is more important for you than television is? Wow. Wow, is there anybody who doesn't feel that way? <laughs> okay. Um, related question, how many of you think the internet is more important to you than your mobile phone is? Mm, right, yeah. You know, now exactly. that surprises me. <laughs> that, that surprises that me surprising. actually even yes. more. So, all right, fine. But well, wait a minute, so, the mobile phone is the internet if you have a smartphone, right? Theoretically. So, I mean, there we go. Right? Theoretically, yes. But, you know, right. talking, texting, you can sometimes do that without the yes. internet. Okay. All right, so now you can see what you, what you started off. This and you is can great. see the sort of an impact you made on people's, on people's lives. Uh, how, did you, how did you start by working on those protocols that eventually became the internet? Uh, in the 1960s, um, ideas came about for interconnecting computers over networks, and those ideas were different than the way the telephone system works. The telephone system uses what's called circuit switching. It sets up a path, and it stays up until somebody hangs up. The packet switch world is more like electronic postcards. The computer generates a piece of data, and it flings it into the net, just like the postal service, except 100 million times faster. And the consequence of this idea was that you could get machines talking to each other and could speak to many different computers all at the same time by sending packets out to each of them whenever there was a piece of data to go. So we were excited about that technology. The De U.S. Defense Department funded the implementation of a network they called the ARPANET. The agency that funded it was the Advanced Research Projects Agency, so we named it after them. Uh, and the question was, can we make this work on a national scale? So we built that network, we operated it starting in 1969, and it was quite successful. At this point, my partner, uh, Bob Kahn, came to my lab at Stanford University, and he said, we have a problem. I said, well, what's the problem? And he said, well, we've demonstrated packet switching on wireline networks, connecting these computers to each other uh, over dedicated telephone circuits. but..." We would like to be able to use this in mobile operation, which means we need radio, ground, ground radio. And we also want it to work in ships at sea, which means we need satellites to connect ships that are very far apart. So we began developing a packet satellite and a packet radio network. Then we asked ourselves, how are we going to connect these things to each other? That was the internet problem, because we were linking nets to each other. During the six-month period, from March of 1973 to September of 73, we explored the possible design of that system. We finished the first paper in September of 1973. It was revised and published in May of 1974, first paper describing what the Internet could be and how it would work. We didn't even call it the Internet. We called it a protocol for packet network intercommunication. By December of 74, we were calling this thing Internet. On January 1, 1983, we turned the internet on with uh, three or four different kinds of networks in operation, mobile packet radio, packet satellite, the ARPANET, and Ethernet coming out of Xerox Park. That's January 1, 1983. So the network has been in operation for 30 years, believe it or not. By 10 years later, Tim Berners-Lee invents the World Wide Web, and nobody notices until a couple of researchers at the National Center for Supercomputer Applications, Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina, develop a browser they call Mosaic. This is a graphical browser, one that you can mix images and text together, 
They released that and about a million people downloaded that software uh, in uh, actually 1992 or 93 or so. Then um, a company called Netscape Communications is formed and hires Eric Bina actually, and, uh, and Mark Andreessen to make a commercial version. And at this point, when they release the commercial versions, the rest of the world wakes up, notices this, and the dot boom is on. So when you were working on this, I mean, I'm sure you didn't anticipate what, what it would eventually become, or did you at that stage? Well, you know, the honest truth is that some of this we did anticipate, and I can give you a few examples, but not everything. I mean, it, how can you possibly imagine what will happen when you connect two or three billion people together sharing information with each other? There was a man named Douglas Engelbart who was funded also by ARPA in the early 1960s. And he had this idea, which was uh, shared by some of the leadership at ARPA, that computers could be used for something besides computation. It could be used for communication and collaboration. So he built a system at SRI International in Menlo Park, California, on a single computer that he called the online system. It allowed you to create text documents, share them with each other, point to other text documents using hyperlinks, and oh, by the way, he invented the mouse that lets you point to places in the text and interact with it or click on it to go to another document. He built what, in effect, was a World Wide Web inside of one box. That was available to us. We saw that going on at, uh, when we were doing the ARPANET program. Xerox Palo Alto Research Center is a mile and a half from my laboratory at Stanford University. They're inventing the Ethernet in 1973. They're building personal computers at the cost of $50,000 each called the Alto machine, at which they've now connected on this three megabit Ethernet. Those guys were living in 1972, 20 years in the future. We saw that too. We had a very clear sense of how powerful this stuff could be. But in 1988, I suddenly realized that this is not going to reach the general public unless it's turned into an economic engine that's self-supporting, because up until that time, only US government-funded uh, agencies and organizations were allowed to get access to it. So if you were a university with a Defense Department contract or uh, from the National Science Foundation, you could get on the net, but not the general public. So uh, when I realized that we needed to do something uh, to make it commercially uh, viable, I started lobbying the American government to connect up a commercial system called MCI Mail, a commercial email service that I had designed for MCI, to the internet. Now, I was trying to break this barrier that said, you can't put commercial traffic on the government backbone. And I thought, well, if they'll let me do this little experiment, that means I'll be putting commercial traffic on the backbone. It will break that policy. And they let me do that. And as soon as we announced that we'd made this interconnection, all the other commercial email services said, wait a minute, wait a minute. They can't be the only ones that get access to this. So they all got connected on the internet. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about that is that before, all of these email services had been completely separate from each other. You couldn't talk uh, across them. But because they'd all been connected on the internet, they suddenly discovered they were interconnected to each other. It was a big surprise. India's number one news app just got even better. Download NDTV's new app, fully optimized for retina display, full screen view, faster response time, and Sudoku. NDTV's new iPad app. Download now.